Hello there, dear viewers, and welcome once more to my little corner of the internet. Today we're going to be reviewing, or rather eviscerating, this little number. So, Knight of the Sources by Iando Binder, the sequel to Menace of the Sources, which I haven't read, but I am probably going to get at some point. Now, as you all know, I've got quite a growing collection of vintage science fiction behind me, garnered from various book halls over the past year. In fact, I've spent way too much money this year. <laughs> I was shocked over the weekend. I worked it out and uh, it was a bit too much. So I'm not going to be buying any more uh, this year. But I've got two other hauls coming. Now, I've got all of, all of those books. We've got Nebula Award winners, Hugo Award winners, Arthur C. Clarke Award winners. We have Masterwork Editions, various other books that you've recommended to me over the past year. And what do I end up reading but something like this? There's a masochistic side of my personality that just eschews all other reason and just goes for a bit of pulp now and then. I just can't help myself. I mean, it's the cover. I just... It's a fantastic cover, I think. I mean, it's from another dimension, evidently. It's beautiful. Uh, but reading the blurb, uh, reading the first sentence even, I just knew I was in for a terrible ride. But that said, a bad book can still be quite entertaining. So we're going to get to all of that in just a moment. First of all, though, let's look at the copy here that I have and peruse it somewhat. Um, later on, there'll be other covers over here from a few other publications. It hasn't been uh, uh, reprinted many times. So, yeah, so there's not many of them on offer. So, yes, I mean, as I said, it looks like it's from another dimension, which is something that always appeals to me of, about these um, older books. It's like they, they are from another reality. I don't know why. <laughs> But there we are. Anyway, the copyright page, um, it's in Roman numerals. Um, so it's from 1972, this particular edition. It was first published in 1971, actually. So it's just a year after. Um, otherwise, it's in very good condition, the, other than the usual browning of the pages. Um, yes, let's just have a quick little sniff there. I can't remember what this was last time, but... Bloody <sighs> Uh, wood, obviously. Uh, walnut, yes. No tobacco. Wood. But anyway, there we are. There's the book. Okay, so the first thing of note is the name. The Ando Binder. I've never come across this before. I mean, that's not saying much because I, I don't know a great deal, um, generally speaking. However, uh, having looked it up, the Ando Binder is actually a pseudonym for two brothers, Otto Oscar Binder and Earl Andrew Binder. So it's a kind of contraction of the two names, uh, portmanteau, if you will. So it's taking the E from Earl, A-N-D from Andrew, and then Otto's got a bit of short thrift uh, at the end with just a solitary O at the end. But it's, yeah, it's, it's both of them working together. So I think it was like during the 30s and 40s they were collaborating on a number of science fiction works. Lots of short stories evidently in uh, fantastic science fiction, I think, um, and various other things, some comic book work as well. But I think um, Earl stopped writing relatively early on um, and was working more as a literary agent for his brother. So Otto does the lion's share of the work after the 40s, I think, 40s or 50s. So this one is one of his later works. I think he actually passed away in 74. So it's only a few years after this book came out. So yeah, it's it's with a heavy heart that I have to eviscerate this now. But but there we are. It's um it isn't a brilliant book. <laughs> okay, first things first, let's try and do a short synopsis of this book without giving away any spoilers. Uh it's a very short book. It's only 150 pages or so. I think it's barely 40,000 words. But uh, for a short book, a hell of a lot gets packed in. So I'm not going to go into the detail yet about where they go, what they do, what happens. 
Only to say that the general gist of it is following a young couple, a young married couple. So we have the husband who's called Fane, uh, who's a young American, strapping young American man. I imagine him with a nice square jaw, various bulging muscles. And he's married to a beautiful alien wife by the name of Mirabelle. She's got red hair and violet coloured eyes. And together they have two main roles in life. The first being occasionally having to ward off various alien hordes from destroying Earth. Uh, the second being attempting to keep UFOs out of the general media, news media. Uh, so it's, it's pretty farcical, but there we are. The irony being that, of course, Mirabelle is an alien and in their garage they have a flying saucer parked there. A flying saucer that can be conveniently turned invisible at, at a push of a button. Now, so in the previous book, which I haven't read, apparently that's about Fane initially coming into contact with these aliens and understanding that there's a, a far greater many other civilizations outside of Earth, and he evidently saves Earth from destruction, more or less single-handedly. This second book is pretty much more of the same thing. We have a new alien invading threat, and only one person can save the day, and that's Fane. Despite the fact that Mirabelle's there all the time helping him, it's Fane that takes all the glory. So that's pretty much it. There's a very convoluted uh, storyline whereby these aliens are trying to, they're looking for these little uh, kind of gemstones that are scattered across Earth that contain vast power that they want to use to transport uh, Earth uh, to another place. It's, it's completely bonkers. Now, this could have been a potentially clever take you know, quite quite a, an interesting and funny idea whereby, you know, trying to keep UFOs out of the, the news, but, but hey, we're aliens. But no, it's, there's, there's nothing clever going on here. It's just a device just to sail around in a flying saucer and uh, encounter various aliens. So if we focus on Fane for a moment here, Fane is the main protagonist here. His wife is more of a sideshow. It's probably a sign of the times that this was written, but he is a walking, talking, misogynistic man-child. Um, and so in the previous book, he's evidently single-handedly saved the world with his incredible intellect and judo-chopping prowess. However, by this book, the sequel, he seems to have degenerated into a bit of a simpleton. Yet despite this fact, his wife continuously applauds him for this, these massive feats of mental gymnastics that he does to solve various problems that, are, that amount to things that a three-year-old could probably solve. So I think some attempt here has been made to model Fane's character on James Bond, albeit without a shred of refinement whatsoever. <laughs> so this square-jawed hunk just merrily punches and kicks his way through a variety of martial arts that are evidently at his disposal. Now, I haven't read the first book, as I've said, but I've read the blurb of it. And apparently, Fane in the first book was a science fiction writer prior to encountering this greater world of uh, alien societies. So where he had the time or inclination to learn these various martial arts is, is, is a complete mystery. Fane's alien smashing escapades make for some of the most remarkable and memorable parts of the uh, book. So I'm going to read a couple of them now and you can kind of get a flavour for what we're dealing with here. <laughs> okay, so right. At this point, uh, Fane is dealing with a couple of miscreants that have um, entered his house. I think they're human. They're gun-toting swines. <laughs> OK. It was at that crucial moment that Fane acted, knowing the gunman's eyes had not yet adjusted to the change in lighting. Twisting, he leapt at them with arms outspread, sweeping all three of them backwards. 
Totally unprepared, they lost their footing and fell. One gunman lost his grip on his gun, which clattered across the marble floor. But the other two gunmen were already scrambling to their feet, guns still in hand. They both fired at Fane, or where he had been. Fane was a blur of motion, making a somersault at the end of which his feet clobbered one gunman full in the chest, sending him flying ten feet against a wall. Ten feet! His head struck with a thud, and with a low groan he slumped out cold. Fane now bounced to his feet, behind him the last gunman, who swung bewilderedly. Before he could aim, Fane's fist smashed into his temple with all the beef of 190 pounds behind it. The leader fell without a sound. Oh, <laughs> absolutely beautiful. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's worthy of praise. Okay, so in this second scene, Fane is having to come face to face with a Vexen, which is the chief threat at the moment against Earth. Uh, these weird humanoid stunted hairy bastards with bald heads and owl eyes I mean it's absolutely crazy uh, but anyway here we go this is Fane in action once more rushing forward with the swiftness of a snake the dwarf lashed out with a fist the blow was like the kick of an elephant bowling him head over heels with beast-like sounds the humanoid leapt on his supine form and began to rake his claws at Fane's face and chest Watching from behind a nearby tree, Mirabelle held her hands to her eyes, moaning inwardly. Did her earth husband, despite his remarkable physical prowess, have any chance against these two stunted fiends? But the humanoid's clawing ended abruptly, as Fane swung an arm around his neck and twisted his whole body with a powerful jerk, slamming the dwarf in onto the ground against hard stone. The vexen lay stunned. But as Fane got to his knees, the other Vexen made a clawing leap at him. His reflexes set for hair-trigger action, Fane flattened himself and the surprised dwarf flew over him. And when the humanoid sprang to his feet, Fane was towering over him and slamming down a rock as big as a football. Rock met helmet and skull with a sodden thump. Fane was dismayed to see the rock crumble in his hands and the dwarf still standing. Had he withstood even this massive blow? But then, swaying on his feet, the Vexen crumpled to the ground. Look out, Fane, came Mirabel's yell. The other one recovered. Fane whirled and saw long, cruel talons flying at him. Fane did a remarkable thing, unbelievable thing. He leapt straight at the approaching humanoid, taking him completely by surprise. The rest, to Mirabel, was a blur of two forms, one large and one small, tangling with each other. She could not see the lightning-fast karate arm twist Fane used with a judo sidestep that caught the dwarf in a vice-like grip, followed by a vertical airplane spin. A moment later, the screeching humanoid flew 25 feet straight up in the air. When he landed, it was on bare rock with with a whomp that spoke of his whole body being jarred violently. 25 feet in the air. That's one hell of a punch. But that's fame for you. Okay, so let's get to the nitty gritty. What I didn't like, more or less the whole book. Now, so this appears to be, I, I would have thought this would have been written in perhaps three days. There's, it just, it just goes all over the place. There's a central idea and it just runs with it. Oh, this happens, oh, this happens. Judo kick, judo punch, all that kind of nonsense. Technology arises when it's needed. Uh, there's a, a thing called a vibroscope. Um, I was expecting something a bit naughty, but no, it was something other than that. The author also loves the color purple. So Mirabelle's eyes are purple. A laser beam will be purple. A disgruntled alien goes purple in the face. I can only assume that this colour is used because it's otherworldly. But yeah, I mean, there's no imagination here. It's just, oh, we need a colour, purple. Yeah, so it's always purple, violet, that end of the spectrum. Another laughable idea is the 
They're called the Vigilantes. So that this is the organization that Fane and his wife work for. They're, they're alien, they're alien protectors. And so they're in this great big ship that orbits Earth that Earth has somehow never seen. I think it's invisible, pro probably invisible, I don't know. Anyway, this civilization's millions of years old and they've been t protecting Earth for millions of years. And yet they are completely stupid and they rely upon Fane who's even more stupid to work pro problems out. So God knows how they've protected Earth in the past. Anyway, so yeah, the idea that they're called the vigilantes is just absurd anyway. But yeah, it it just doesn't make sense. They're millions of years old, this culture, the high technology, and yet completely stupid. <laughs> and they're imbued with, I would say, 1950s uh, American mentality. So there's nothing interesting going on with the uh, different races and different uh, alien societies or whatever it's all it's all very one note if you will there's one one moment where they go to a kind of zoo uh, intergalactic zoo and and you see various creatures described i mean it's quite kind of interesting but again it was just like Something you'd write down on the back of an envelope. Well, what should we do? Oh, we'll give it two heads or whatever. Yeah, so not much going on there. Yeah, so you've got, you've had a taste of the way it's written. I mean, it, it doesn't get any better than that. But it is quite amusing. Not intentionally, of course, but it is quite funny. That said, it was proofread quite well. I didn't really notice many mistakes whatsoever. I mean, it's a very small book, so it wouldn't have taken long to edit the thing. The For a very short book, this thing flies by the seat of its pants. So this is one thing that I did like about it. I mean, the, it goes all over the place. In other books where uh, a voyage to the moon, for example, might take the uh, an author a few chapters to really get into. In this book, they managed to do things like that with a single sentence. So <laughs> we are bounding, we're going through space, we're going to space stations, we're cavorting around Earth. We're going under the oceans in, in a flying saucer. We're going into the Earth, uh, into subterranean caves. We're going to the middle of the fucking galaxy. It goes all over the place, moving at a breathtaking pace. That was something I loved. I mean, <laughs> as stupid as the story was, we went all over the place in a very short space of time. So each chapter was quite interesting. So there we are. Yes, it, it, it was a terrible book, but good as well uh, for those other reasons I've mentioned. So if we rate this fellow, so I'm afraid the usual star rating isn't adequate to, as a measure for this because it wouldn't even get one point at the star. I mean, it might get a point. We'll give it a point. Yeah, there we are. So you had one point of one star. However, I'm going to have to employ another grade. So this grade will be used for shit books. Um, so I'm going to give this five brown stars. <laughs> now, yeah, so a brown star. So five brown stars is actually a good thing. So it's a crap book that I've enjoyed. So as crap books go, I really enjoyed it. However, yeah, going by the usual scale that I read, um, rate over books, it's just not adequate. But so for a five brown star review, this one gets banished to the heaven that is the bog of eternal stench. <laughs> So there we are, another book vanquished. So um, yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope you might want to read that book now. Um, <laughs> I looked at some Amazon reviews. There were two reviews at the time for Knights of the Sources. One five-star review saying it was brilliant pulp uh, science fiction uh, from back in the day. The other one saying one star, absolute drivel. So yeah, so it depends on your take really. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it in a bad way. Or it was bad in a good way. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. Uh, next week, there will be a new book haul. I've got two book hauls coming. 
One's going to be horror related and one's going to be fleshy covers uh, of the Gore and Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, tradition. So yeah, there we are. One of those coming up next week. Uh, yeah, so let's leave it there. Apologies, it's probably been shambolic. Uh, I had problems earlier. Bastard alarm kept going on outside. Then there were scaffolders um, cavorting about and I almost lost my tits. But anyway, we're there now and it's pissing down now. Anyway, let's leave it there. Thanks for watching. Cheerio. See you next time. Cheerio. Mm -hmm. <laughs>